This is the last presentation video of the semester. After this, we're doing SOL review. So we left off uh, last time talking about our arthropods. And uh, remember, they had exoskeletons. And now we're moving on to our chordates. So this is what uh, phylum we belong to. So again, uh, remembering our acronym, there is the domains, the kingdoms, the phylums, the classes, the orders, the families, the genuses, and species. Those are all of the levels, right? And so, for example, at domain, there's only three. You are either a eukaryote, an RK, or you are bacteria. And then in kingdoms, uh, for example, for eukaryotes, we've got animal kingdom, plant, fungus, protist. And then in phylums, uh, that's what we're talking about here. So the core date here is a phylum. But of course, uh, there are sometimes things in between these, so that is what this is. This is a subphylum. So it's not specific enough to be a class. It's not quite a class. It's just a subphylum. So there is a subphylum that we belong to called the vertebrates. Um, so what is a chordate? A chordate is just something that has a nerve cord that runs down the back from the brain. It is an extension cord of the brain. Right, so, you, so you've got this brain, and it's got to talk to the body. It talks to the body through the spine. That spine, if protected by a bony vertebra, puts us in the subphylum vertebrata. And so they have bony skeletons, and this includes sometimes a backbone and a spinal cord. Uh, it can also be made of cartilage, so we see things like sharks. They, they belong to vertebrata. Um, but they are not making their, their backbone of bone, rather they're making it of cartilage, which is the same stuff found in your ear. All right, so then in, um, I guess this, this is not really a class, but it, there, these are categories. There are cold-blooded and there are warm-blooded organisms. And so ectotherms, Ecto means outside, and endotherms. And then, of course, therm would mean temperature. So ectotherms have body temperatures that are the same as their environment, whereas endotherms are able to create their own heat for their body. And so that has some implications. So let's, um, let's look at what that means. So first of all, I want you to be aware that the phylum is chordata. So chordata simply means that there is a brain and then there is an extension of that brain running down the body, right? And so for example, this is a very simple chordata. This is a chordata that does not have a spinal cord. So this is not part of our subphylum vertebrata. This is not a vertebrata. It is only chordata. And so cephalochordata, this is one of the first um, chordates that we know of, very early chordate. Let's compare that to the subphylum vertebrata. So this by comparison is vertebrata. We've got our brain here and our spinal cord is running through this, but then we also have this bony protection to prevent that nerve from being severed. Because if you did sever this nerve, let's say that you, um, you broke your nerve here, that means that the brain can no longer talk to this part of the body. So everything below here becomes paralyzed. So you would not be able to walk. If you broke it here, that means the body would not be able to talk to any of this and you would be paralyzed from the neck down. And so to help prevent us from snapping our spinal cords, we have 
this vertebra to protect us. We also have, as you can see here, nerves running off of our spinal cord. This is a lot like having an extension cord, right? Let's say that you've got your TV on one side of the room, but your outlet is way over here. You've also got a lamp uh, that you need lit over here. And let's say, what else do people have in their rooms? Uh, let's say you have an oil diffuser. People like those nowadays. You have to have an extension cord running along your house, right? And then the extension cord plugs in to all these periphery things. The same thing with your body. You've got this brain, you've got this extension cord, and these are all plugging into things. So for example, this would plug into your arms. They go all the way down here. These would plug into your legs. Uh, these actually plug into your um, genital area and lower back. Uh, and then something like this might go to a to a lung or a heart. They are all needed for the body. Next, uh, warm versus cold blooded. So this does not literally mean like this picture would suggest that you either have warm or cold blood. It it means something else. So what it means actually is that warm blooded creatures like the ones that are shown here. Um, here we have a bird. It is uh, so, sort of warm-blooded. Um, and we have mammals here. Here's another bird. They are able to do something special. They can take their food and burn it to produce more heat. Whereas if you go over here on this side of the scale, they cannot do that. So there are some costs and benefits. Obviously, more energy is used when you are giving off your energy as heat. This helps to keep your body warm if it's cold outside. But if you're over here, you are not expending that energy. And so you can get away with actually eating less. So for example, uh, the, the, the crocodile has been known to go for years without eating. They can eat one, one prey item and survive for years by just sort of not using any of their energy. They store almost all of their energy and, and not a lot of it is wasted as heat. Whereas we purposely, over here, we will purposely allow a lot of our energy to go towards heat production and this can keep us warm. So, uh, and then of course in the middle here, you have the dinosaurs and sharks. They, they, have, they are cold blooded, but they're so big that they still need a lot of energy. That's why they're in the middle, right? And so there are disadvantages and advantages to being cold-blooded or warm-blooded. Um, so the ectotherms, they have to eat less. Whereas the endotherms, they have to eat more because they have to supply that heat. This has some implications in where things can live, right? So for example, um, amphibians, these are things like um, salamanders or, or um, frogs. Uh, here we have a distribution map, so the more red it is, the, uh, the more that we find them. And you can see that they're pretty much located around this area, um, along the equatorial area. Here we see some in seasonal climates, but for the most part, it's in the middle of the planet because that is where there's the most heat. Um, this has other implications, right? So where do we find the most organisms on our planet that are poisonous? Do we find them here? Do we find them, do we find them like in Australia? Do we find them in South America? The answer is, of course, we find most poison, poisonous creatures close to the equator. And this is because most poisonous creatures are amphibians or lizards or cold-blooded animals. Um, and it just so happens that that is only a correlation. It is not heat that causes, a lot of people used to think that heat could somehow influence toxin production, but in fact, it doesn't. Um, it is only a correlation 
Um, it just so happens that ectotherms are the ones who are most often poisonous, and they happen to live near the equator, as you can see here. Now let's compare that to the distribution of, say, a warm-blooded creature like deer. Like our, our, we have white-tailed deer here. There's also black-tailed deer. There are elk. There are all sorts of deer. Um, we find them just everywhere, and that is because they are warm-blooded, which enables them to live in both hot and cold climates. It gives them a much greater range. And so the cost is they have to eat a lot more, but the benefit is they can live in a lot more places. Now we will move on to another chordate. And so, of course, we are now talking about a class. This is a class, not a phylum. This is still a chordate. We are still in the phylum chordata and we are still in the subphylum vertebrata, but there are several different types of fish here. So actually, um, if this is a class, that would mean that these would be orders. So we've got the Agnatha order, we've got the Chondrichthyses order, sharks, um, sorry, that's Chondrichthyses. We've got uh, Osteichthyses, that is another order. So we have three orders here. Agnatha are jawless, that is like this guy here, they can open their jaw very wide. Um, and then we have chondrichthyses, which are the like sharks and rays and other things like that. They do not actually have bones that are made of, uh, they're like calcified like yours, they have cartilage. It's the same material that you find in your ear that makes it very flexible. That is what their bones are made of, and so they are very flexible organisms. And then we have, uh, so those are the sharks, rays, and the skates, as well as this thing here. And then we have osteichthyses, and those are the bony fish. You have to be careful when you fillet them, when you, when you clean them, to make sure you get all the bones out. And they have uh, sort of the same arrangement we do with a bony skeleton. And so that means, due to homology, these are probably our more recent ancestors than, say, these guys here. Next we have amphibians. Amphibians are characterized by having smooth skin that's very thin. They are actually, their skin is thin enough so that they can actually breathe through their skin. They do have lungs because their internal organs could not be properly oxygenated without them, but they can diffuse a lot of oxygen through their skin alone. And so it is very necessary then for them to have moist and healthy skin. These include frogs, toads, and salamanders. They also have uh, metamorphosis. Am I saying that right? They go through metamorphosis uh, in a similar way that a cocoon becomes a butterfly. Uh, so two does a tadpole become a frog and so they have different life stages and what that basically means is um, if you look at say a tadpole and you look at a frog oh boy i'm gonna have to draw a frog They look very different, and that is because, yeah, so they look very different, but they actually have the exact same DNA. So how could they look so different at different stages of life, but have the exact same DNA? The answer is simple. They just read different parts of it. Uh, just like you read different parts of your DNA, um, for different tasks, for different cells, uh, they can read different sets of DNA to become different stages of life. And so they read tadpole DNA when they're younger, and then they switch to reading frog DNA when they're older, and that helps to change their phenotype. So metamorphosis is just a process of reading different sets of DNA at different stages of life, and that is actually an SOL question. All right, um, the frogs are in trouble. Not toads, um, not salamanders either, but our frogs. 
are in uh, trouble. And the reason why is, again, they have thin skin and they need that skin to be nice and thin so that they can uh, breathe properly. Unfortunately, there is this fungus that is infecting their skin, irritating their skin and making their skin too thick. When their skin is too thick, um, basically just how, just like if you lift weights too much, your hands will start to become calloused. Their skin will become calloused and then they cannot breathe and they die. So this is called chytridiomycota. And uh, now normally this wouldn't be a big issue. Eventually through natural selection, the frogs would simply evolve. However, human intervention has made that hard for them. So the reason why it's difficult for frogs to survive chytridiomycota and evolve past it is because uh, global warming is heating up water too much across the planet, which is allowing these uh, fungus to thrive. And then on top of that, humans um, quite frequently will travel uh, with the chytrid on their clothing, and so they're spreading it. And so the issue here is remember that that evolution is a process of change. This frog might evolve, but the problem with evolution is it takes time. It takes generations to occur, many generations. The problem is, is this problem is amplifying too quickly. It is faster than natural selection, and so the frog cannot keep up. Change is a constant in our world. It's always happening. And there's nothing wrong with that. Natural selection needs change, but when the change is too fast, that is the issue. Uh, that's the same reason why we're seeing problems with global warming. It's not that the earth is getting warmer, it's that it's happening too quickly. Okay, so now let's go to reptiles. Reptiles are a lot like our amphibians, but they have dry, scaly skin, and they usually lay eggs as opposed to like tadpoles. Um, so reptiles include snakes, alligators, lizards, and turtles. Actually, my mistake. Amphibians do lay eggs. So they'll usually, like a frog, will lay eggs on a leaf or something, and then those legs will drop and they'll become tadpoles. So they both lay eggs, um, but these have like shells on their eggs. And then reptiles include snakes, alligators, lizards, and turtles. You can usually tell it's a reptile if it has scales, which are really... Um, Scales are a very early form of hair. Turns out that scales and hair are made of the same stuff. Uh, the hair on your arm is really just a modified scale. Fun fact. Okay, so let's compare our amphibians to our, um, to our reptiles. And so over here we have a reptile. And then here we have an amphibian. Oops. Did I spell that right? I did not. There's an M there. My bad. I'm terrible at spelling. Okay, so we've got amphibians and we got reptiles. And here's their difference. So if you look very carefully, you will see that this guy has scales. And this guy does not. He's got just smooth skin. He's got some ripples here, but that's just smooth skin. There is no scales. Um, and so actually this is, uh, this is a reptile, but we sometimes just call it a lizard. That is just being more specific. And this is a salamander. Salamander. Next we have birds, which are really just a, they're a very recent um, evolutionary creature. They, they very recently came onto the scene. In fact, um, they're, they're doing pretty well compared to other species because they're so new. A lot, of, a lot of prey species are not used to having to avoid these creatures, and so they are really doing well right now. Um, they, of course, most of them can fly, not all of them, but they're characterized as being warm-blooded, sort of. They don't have the same capacity to heat themselves up like we do, and so they, ha they do have to migrate a lot. You do see birds migrating a lot, because although they are warm-blooded, they're not quite as good at it as we are, so they do have to move around a little bit. Um, warm-blooded animals that lay eggs... Uh, a lot like our lizards. So they're very similar to lizards, uh, uh, very similar to, uh, sorry, reptiles in general. 
Uh, specifically, the recent ancestor was shared with reptiles, and that was a dinosaur. So they actually came from this, the Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is what we call a transition species. And that is because um, it was a dinosaur, and then it became a bird. Uh, here's the actual fossil remains, um, how we know that it exists, and uh, this is what it probably looked like. And so th this was sort of a gradual transition. There was some sort of dinosaur that was predatory, and to help catch its prey, it would glide. It had modified scales. Feathers are just scales. Here's a scale, right? All we do is, is we flatten out that scale, and now it can be used for wind resistance, and you can start flying. The bones also started to hollow out to make it more capable of gliding, and that gliding eventually turned into flying. And so we see a lot of homology between birds and reptiles. So for example, um, if we go back to the reptile, they again, they lay eggs, right? And they have scales. If you go to birds, they kind of have scales too, only they've been turned into feathers, and they also lay eggs, so with a shell. So very, very similar. Next we go to us. So again, this is still vertebrata, the phylum. This is still the subphylum. Um, sorry, the, the, the phylum was chordata, and the subphylum is vertebrata. And now we're moving down to the class of mammals. And so mammals are warm-blooded, so they're endotherms. They can heat up their blood uh, or their body. They have hair, which again is a, a scale that has been strawn out. Um, they give birth to their offspring, and uh, they also, that, so they give live birth, they don't lay eggs, and they produce milk. There is one exception to the egg laying thing, well actually there's two. Um, so the platypus lays eggs, and so does the echidna. You can look up what that is if you want. And so they, uh, the, the, the basic thing is they, they all produce milk and they're warm-blooded. Um, and, and actually, it turns out whales are also warm-blooded. There's a lot of marine creatures that are, that are mammals. And this is because there was some sort of, of transition species that, that was on land, but then it decided it wanted to go back into the water. And so we see a lot of mammals that actually live in the sea, even though mammals originally evolved on land. And so the evidence of this is you can, you can watch them actually breastfeed. So this is a whale that is actually um, breastfeeding. Kind of neat. All right, last uh, we've got hearts. So there's some homology um, between the different hearts, uh, but there are some differences too. So fish, for example, are uh, the least related of all of these and they have two chamber hearts. So fish have sort of an imperfect way of oxygenating their blood, right? You've got lungs, and then you've got the heart, and then you've got the body, right? So the way it typically works is the heart receives blood that is not oxygenated, it sends it to the lungs, and then the lungs send it back to the heart, and then the heart sends it to the body. That's, that's the path we generally take, right? So again, this is no oxygen, and then this is with oxygen. <clears throat> That's generally how it works. Now the way our heart is set up is we've got chambers to accomplish this. We've got um, the right atrium, we've got the right ventricle, we've got the left atrium, and we've got the left ventricle. And so there's valves uh, between them. And then we have um, a big vein that comes in that supplies blood from the body that's been used up. It goes in, filters into this ventricle, the ventricle squeezes, and 
blood goes out to the lungs. The lungs then fill it with oxygen and then it comes back into the left, sorry, the right atrium. It then goes into the right ventricle and then it comes back out of the ascending aorta and it goes to the body, right? And so that's um, four chambers and they're all separated. Fish are a little different, right? So they've got um, only two chambers. They've got right chamber and the left chamber. And basically they receive blood here that has not got oxygen. And then they pump it out to the lungs and it comes back into this part here. And then it goes out to the body. And so the problem is there's no wall here. There's no, there's no wall. And so actually uh, they call this non-oxygenated blood blue blood and they call the stuff that is oxygenated red blood. The blue and the red blood mix and so it's not a perfect system. Um, next we got amphibians and they have three chambered hearts and it's, it's very similar. Uh, they've got a little bit more separation of, of blood but not as much. Uh, reptiles have four chambered hearts like we do. Uh, and they are partially divided, but there is still some mix. And of course, mammals have the four chambered hearts, which is the most evolved heart. They're all divided from each other. And so this is the, probably the best design and the most recent. Uh, birds, actually, birds actually have uh, four chambered hearts like we do that are separated. All right, so there we go. That's all. That's the last lecture. I hope it was uh, pretty easy. And um, next we're going to do SOL review, so be on the lookout for that on Classcraft.